you'll turn your Bibles with me to Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verse 6 and 7. The greatest event in human history. If that was the title that I would have to give you today, Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verse 6 and 7, the greatest event of human history. Verse 6 says, of the ninth chapter of Isaiah, Page 497, my Bible, if that's helpful for you. <clears throat> says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, <coughs> Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. <coughs> Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice. From henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it or perform this. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I bow before you today, humble to stand before you and preach your word from the word of God. And Lord, today I pray that I hide behind the cross the greatest event in human history has taken place at Christmas. And Lord, may we not forget that. And may we realize that you're the reason for the season. And Lord, I pray that if there's one lost, that today they may find that baby Jesus in the manger. And Lord, if there's one that's distraught, may they find peace. Because you came to the earth to be the Prince of Peace. Lord, the last thing you gave us was peace before you left. And Lord, also today I pray that if there's one that just needs to praise the name of Jesus, that they'll praise it because you have a wonderful name. But Lord, the greatest event in human history, let us not miss the main event. Let us realize it's a story about you and you alone. And Lord, I pray that as we celebrate Christmas that we realize that there's none other like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless you and direct us now. Let us seek your will in all that we do. And Lord, we do this to give you glory. And Lord, may we push Satan aside and may we truly worship you like never before. And we pray this now in your precious and holy name. Jesus Christ, amen. Years ago, an American astronaut climbed down a ladder and put his feet on the surface of the moon. And the President of the United States of America said the greatest event in human history is when men or man put his feet on the moon. Now, I don't mean any disrespect to the President of the United States, but I want to say he was totally wrong. The greatest event in human history was not putting a man on the moon, my friends, but it's when the Almighty God stepped out of heaven, came down out of the ivory palaces into this world of woe, and put his feet on this earth. We call that incarnation. We also call that Christmas morning. You see, Isaiah prophesied in the sixth verse, and that's mainly what we're going to look at in verse 6. He says, for, as, uh, for unto us as a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. My friends, this was written 700 years before the first Christmas. Isaiah dipped his pen in the glory of of God and wrote those words about the coming Prince of Peace, which is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What good, what good, now think about this, what good does it do to put a man on the moon but we can't get God in our hearts? My friends, what good is it to know astronomy, which is the study of stars, and see how the heavens go, and not know the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the bright and morning star, and know how heaven goes? What good is it? What good is it to know botany, the study of flowers, and, and know 
uh, not Jesus. Do you not realize heaven's sweetest rose, the, the rose of Sharon, can perfume any kind of life and his name is Jesus? What good is it to know geology and the uh, ages of uh, or the age of rocks and not know Jesus Christ, which is the rock of ages, which we can say today, even in Christmas season, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. My friend, how sad it is for a person to claim to be smart and educated and know history from the beginning to the end and miss the main event of human history. My friends, which is the story of Jesus Christ. His story, not ours, not Santa Claus's, not the Easter bunnies, not the presents, not the lights, not the bells, not the trees, but Jesus. That's the story of Christmas. The greatest event in human history has taken place. And my friends, the greatest moment in history was not putting a man on the moon. It was Jesus Christ that was born in the form of a baby in a stall, lying in a manger uh, with swaddling clothes on in the city of Bethlehem. That is the greatest moment. And today I want to share with you that I want to say that a wise man is ignorant, a rich man is poor, and a strong man is weak until he knows the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior until he knows and understands what Isaiah said right here in the sixth verse. What does that sixth verse say? There's three thoughts in this verse. And I want to give you three thoughts in this verse that I see. And I pray this will radiate upon your heart and upon your mind that you will allow the Christ of Christmas to live in you. Don't miss the greatest event that ever taken place in human history. The greatest thing is Jesus, not the man on the moon. And I'm thankful that I serve a Christ that was born in Bethlehem. That very same child created everything that we're enjoying today. So there's three things I want to give you out of this verse. The first one is very simply, Jesus' supernatural nature. Jesus' supernatural nature. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? Now, my friends, he wasn't just any child. He was supernatural. Does anybody believe that Jesus Christ was supernatural? He was uh, not just a Galatian peasant that, that was a great teacher. You won't understand Christmas until you understand the supernatural uh, nature of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This child, Jesus. It was also said in Isaiah 7, verse 14, it tells us that Jesus was born of a virgin. This child is the very son of God. This first Christmas, he sent a package to earth. Our God sent a package to earth for you and I. And this package was the gift of deity, deity wrapped in humanity. And my friends, that's supernatural. You see, Christmas is a time to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that is supernatural. Do not ever forget this. Listen very closely. Do never forget this. Write it on your hearts and mind. Jesus is God and human flesh. Jesus is God in human flesh. Don't, don't forget that. Because we must realize that's what is supernatural about our Lord and Savior. Can any other Savior in this world or any other idol that you worship, anything else greater than our Jesus that you want to put before Jesus, did, was he born of a virgin? And did he resurrect from the grave? And is he still alive today? Or can you go to the cemetery and find him? You see, Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's not just a repetition of two thoughts, of, of the same thought. That's two different thoughts. Did you realize that? Because when it says unto us, uh, when it says unto us a child is born, that speaks of the humanity of Jesus. But then when it says unto a, a, us a son is given, that speaks of the deity of Jesus Christ. Heaven's son given to earth. 
And, and there you have the supernatural nature without a shadow of a doubt. We should be celebrating this Christmas season. We should not only ring the bells, we must be celebrating within our heart that God sent his only son to die for us so that we may have eternal life and that we can have eternity with him. If there was never a birth, there would never have been a resurrection. And so we need to realize that today and apply it to our hearts this Christmas season. Don't let the hustle and bustle and the gifts and all those things distract you from the main event. That is the greatest event of human history. The supernatural uh, nature of Jesus. But I want to share with you what John 1, the first verse 1 through 3 says. John 1, verse 1 through 3. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. It says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's wonderful. John is getting it right where it belongs. Now, my friends, when verse 1 of John 1, 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, Jesus is called the Word. He's called the Word. Now listen, a word is an expression of an invisible thought. Now listen, you can't hear my thoughts, but you can hear my words. And therefore you can know my thoughts, because you hear my words. You can't see my thoughts, my thoughts are invisible. But by the Word makes the invisible known to you. Now listen. Jesus makes the invisible of God known to us. Jesus came to, to, to share the unknown, the invisible God known to man. Matter of fact, he is the very word of God. He is the word of God to this human race. He is the God of human flesh. The baby in Bethlehem is not only God, it is the Word. And thank God that Jesus came to bring the Word to you and I this Christmas season. The Apostle John was certainly older when he wrote, uh, wrote this. He was certainly a Jew. And, and he was ingrained with a resistance to any kind of idolatry. But listen to what he said about Jesus Christ. You know what he said about Jesus Christ? That he is fully God. Now today I want to share with you, not only are we worshiping Jesus that was born in Bethlehem, we are worshiping God himself. We've got to realize that that's what Christmas is all about. Everything that God is, Jesus is. Everything that God has, Jesus has. And everything that God does, Jesus does. Can, you get a, can I get an amen for that? You see, there has never been any other like the Lord Jesus Christ who has the supernatural nature. And today we must realize the nature of our Jesus and why he came and what he's doing and what he desires from you this Christmas season. Now, if somebody comes to your door, knocks on your door, and doesn't believe that Jesus is God, he's a false prophet. Because it says in Hebrews 1.8, it says, unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. His throne is forever and ever. So why is he supernatural nature? Is we are celebrating a Jesus that is supernatural because there's no other throne like him. There's no other God like him. There's no one else that gave his life for you. And he is supernatural and he deserves worship at Christmas season. If somebody tells you that he is not God, then you need to shut the door and run. Now, my friends, here's what I want to tell you. It, it, some of you have wondered and want to know how in the world to get rid of Jehovah Witnesses. They knock on your door. I admire their faithfulness. They come knocking on your door. And they, all you have to say to them, and they will never knock on your door again, you ask them one question. The question is simply as this. Do you worship Jesus? And they'll run from your house. Because I want to tell you, Jesus is God himself. 
And if we don't worship Jesus of Christmas, then we are in trouble. And I want to tell you today, they do not worship Jesus, period. End of conversation. That's all you have to say. Because today I want you to understand that this baby in Bethlehem, this little lion in a manger, this, this Jesus is our God. My friends, we need to realize that today. And his throne lives forever. The baby of Bethlehem is not only fully God, he is a forever God. Jesus didn't have his beginning in Bethlehem. Did y'all know that? When the Bible says, in the beginning was the word, it's not talking about a start, it's talking about a state. The state that it was in. There was never a time when Jesus was not, and there will never be a time when Jesus is not. I mean, billions and billions and billions of t days and years from now, he is still God, he is the everlasting God. When Jesus was born, did you realize that he was older than his mother and even as old as his father? What? Yes, he was. You say, what, what in the world are you talking about, Brother Jeff? Is, is that you're saying that Jesus is God. He is God. It is God himself. He was born. And my friends, I want you to realize he is the son of heaven. So Jesus didn't did begin in a manger. He came to earth and was manifested in the manger. He was manifested in the manger. Now, what I want you to think about today when I talk about the supernatural nature of Jesus, I want you to think of humanity. That little baby wrapped in the swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, was the great, eternal, uncreated, self-existing Word made flesh. Are you listening? The little baby in Luke 2 is the mighty God in Genesis 1. It's the same one. That little baby lying in the straw with those dimpled feet is the very one who swung planets into the space. That little toddler learning to walk by holding Mary's hand back in those days is eternal and the uncreated God. That little baby playing in the shavings in Joseph's carpenter shop is God manifested in the flesh. And that blows my mind away because, uh, you know, we worship this little baby and he's the son of God, but that son of God is really God himself in human flesh. He came to be the word. He came to share the word at Christmas season for you and I so that we may be saved and that we may have a relationship with him. If that's not supernatural, I don't know what supernatural is. And I share it with you more so than ever. I love this verse, 1 Timothy 3.16. Listen to what it says. And great is the mysteries of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's 1 Timothy 3.16. Let me read that again. It says, And great is the mystery of godliness. God, uh, God was manifested in the flesh. If you don't understand that, uh, you're not supposed to. Okay? The reason you're not supposed to understand it is because Paul himself said, I don't understand. Great is the mystery of God. That God stepped out of heaven, came to earth through the portals of a virgin birth. That's supernatural. And today I want you to understand that as we put our feet under our pews every single Sunday through the month of December, that we need to be celebrating the supernatural nature of Jesus because there's no one else that's done what he's done. There's no other one that laid in that manger. There's no one else that has done what he desires to do for humankind. He could have stayed in heaven if he had any sense. I know if I had any sense, I'd have stayed in heaven. Man, he had it made. I mean, there, there was Krispy Kreme on every corner. I mean, there was a Piccadilly on the other side. There was a Chick-fil-A. Why in the world would you want to come to the world of woe and live and die for a nation and for a world that doesn't care for you? That's supernatural. You see, emotions do not play the part in the birth of Jesus Christ. Now... I know there's some people that are that there's some people who sneer at the idea of a virgin birth. Do you believe that there's people that make fun of a virgin birth? Do you know our world says it's impossible? And then all I want to do is turn, tell them to turn your books to Luke the first chapter verse 37 where the angel was speaking to Mary. 
And listen to what the angel said unto Mary in the 31st verse of the first chapter of Luke. He says, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Do you believe that today? That we serve an impossible God that can do the impossibilities and make them possible right before us. It says, with God, nothing is impossible. If you have trouble believing the virgin birth, let me share with you uh, that you are in real trouble. Because I want to tell you, you're real in trouble with God, not with me or with the church, but with God. Be reasonable. If God create the first man without a father and mother, what makes you think that our God can't create a child from a virgin birth and bring it to earth? What what makes you want to even think that? If you don't believe in the virgin birth, you have some character problems. You say, well, what are my character problems if I don't believe in a virgin birth? Well, your problem is with the Word of God. And you're saying that you don't believe the character of the Word of God. You believe the character of, of the Word of God is flawed. My friends, my Word says that it clearly and plainly teaches Jesus was born of a virgin. I believe from Genesis to Revelation, I believe it's the infallible word of God. I believe that those prophets that wrote that to us meant it with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their soul, and they were ordained by the Holy Spirit of God. And so I tell you, you have problems with the word of God. But also, if you don't believe in a virgin birth, not just the word of God you have a problem with, you have difficulty with the character of Mary. You're saying that Mary had a child out of wedlock and she's a harlot. Now, my Bible never says Mary was a harlot. It didn't at all. Matter of fact, the angel said to him, You have been blessed to be a virgin to share in the birth of the Lord of the world. He didn't say anything about a harlot. He said it was put into you by, guess what? A word that we as Baptists sometimes are scared of, especially at Christmas time, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit put Jesus in the womb of a virgin birth. And so if you don't believe in a virgin birth, then my friends, you don't believe in the character of Mary. And if you don't believe that a virgin birth, you are saying you have difficulty with the character of Jesus. Listen, if Jesus is not the Son of God, then you're saying he's the son of Adam. And my friends, the last time I checked the Word of God, it says all the sons of Adam do what? Nobody said anything. Are y'all awake? All the sons in Adam do what? Let's let's try this all together. Well, I'm going to say one, two, three, and y'all say die, okay? That's the word. Okay, y'all don't know what the word is. It's die. All right, let's do this. One, two, three, die. Die. That's right. They all die. Why did they die? Because they are of the nature of the world and not of Christ. Listen, Christ was born not as the nature of Adam because he would die. Folks, you don't even have something to stand on because you're saying Jesus' character is flawed. How can it be flawed? Because, my friends, my Jesus is not dead. He may be in heaven, but he's alive inside of me. So you have no leg to stand on. You're thinking that, that, that you have a character problem with the Word of God. Folks, you're playing with something. They have been trying to prove the Bible as a lie for over 2,000 years, and they have not done it yet. They have tried their best to make Mary a harlot, and it was the Holy Spirit that put Jesus in that womb. And my friends, if you've got a character problem with Jesus, you're saying that, hey, Jesus, you were made of Adam. And folks, my Jesus was never made of Adam. So if you don't believe in the virgin birth, I have a difficulty with your character. Because listen, I don't mean to be rude by any means. But if there's not a virgin birth, you're going to hell. If there's not a virgin birth, you're going to hell. Let me tell you why. Your salvation is interwoven with the virgin birth. My friends, no, uh, no virgin birth, no deity. No deity, there'll be no sinless life. No sinless life, no sacrificial death. No sacrificial death, there's no salvation. Folks, no salvation, you're going to hell. That's just the true fact. Jesus came to earth that we may go to heaven. That baby that was born in Bethlehem in that manger 
wrapped in swaddling clothes, was born so you and I can go to heaven. If that's not supernatural, you don't know the story of Jesus this Christmas. And I want to share with you that more so than ever, Jesus was born of a virgin that we may be born again. Thank God for the virgin birth, amen? Thank God for the supernatural nature of Jesus Christ. Because he could have said, no, I'm not doing that. But he came to this earth. Supernatural nature for you and I. This Christmas is about what do we think of that baby wrapped in those swaddling clothes. Is he supernatural to you? Or is it just something else we do on Christmas season? The second thing that I wanted to share with you this morning that I get from this verse, and I'm, I'm gleaning from this verse 6, is that Jesus' sovereign, sovereign nobility. Jesus' sovereign nobility. Now, what do I mean by that? Not only do I get that Jesus is supernatural nature, but, not, but also his so, sovereign nobility. Folks, maybe you didn't realize verse 6 says, the government shall be upon his shoulder. Did you read that? I believe that when Isaiah, and listen, he wrote this 700 years before the first birth, and he says the government, the government, did you hear that? Government, I, it, it, listen, it didn't say the welfare office. It didn't say the, the place where you vote for somebody. It says the government shall be on his shoulders. Is that not what it says? Did I misread that? Maybe I misunderstood. Maybe church and state needs to play a role in this. Maybe we need to change that verse. No, Isaiah prophesied it. Look again, if you will, to verse 7 and read even further. It says, And the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end unto the throne of David unto his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice and from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Folks, the government was formed for God, by God, to God. That's what it was formed for. Folks, what is his sovereign nobility? He was born a king. He was born a king. It says the government shall be on his shoulders. And, and folks, this little baby was born to be a king. He's a king. He didn't, we didn't elect him and we can't impeach him. He came to be the king. And my friends, he is the king, he is the Lord. And I'm thankful that I serve in this Christmas season the, the sovereignty of his nobility, that I come to say, you know, he's the king. And you see, in churches today, we have forgotten that he's the king. The pastor's not the king, the deacons are not the king, nobody's the king in a church but Jesus. He's the king. He was born to be the king. And the king is who we need to follow in this Christmas season. People say all the time, well, I'll just make him Lord of my life. Well, folks, I want to tell you something. You're too late. God has already declared him as the Lord. He's already declared him as Lord. Matter of fact, there, the, there's verses that say he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And if you miss that, you miss the very meaning of Christmas. He's born to be a king. This Christmas, are you going to let a lot of the confusion in the world distract you? from worshiping the king. He was born to be king. Not the hustle and bustle of the mall. Not running your credit card up to $20,000 buying gifts. That's not Christmas. Christmas is the sovereign nobility saying he's the king. He's the Lord of this world. The government shall be upon his shoulders. His government. And my friends, we must put that to our hearts and minds because he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords and we need to rejoice in this Christmas. Listen, you have to take the, the cradle, the cross, and the crown and put them all together to have the true meaning of Christmas. The true meaning. You've got to put the cradle, you've got to put the cross, and you've got to put the crown all together to have the true meaning of Christmas. So the question is, have you made him Lord of, or King of your life? You say no. Can you receive him as King? Yes. You can get on your da down on your knees and say, L Oh Lord, you're the King and the government is upon your shoulder. Therefore, I yield my heart to you. So today I share with you, let us not take lightly 
what Christmas is about. That it first begins with the supernatural nature of our Jesus. Then the sovereign nobility of our Jesus. He's king. And my friends, do we treat the king like he's supposed to be treated? Are you worshiping him right now in this very moment in your seat? Are you calling him king of your life? Or is your job the king? Or is there other things in the way? Folks, that's idols. We need to remove the idols and idolatry from our lives. And we need to make him first and only. And folks, we can only worship one God. And that God should be God. Now, the third thing that I want to tell you this morning about this Christmas season. About the greatest event ever in human history. The supernatural nature. The sovereign nobility. But my friends, Jesus' name is a saving name. It's a saving name. Jesus' is a saving name. Now what in the world? It says what in verse 6? It says, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Now what's in this name? First of all, it's wonder in his name. Do you stand in awe of the Lord Jesus Christ today? Do we stand in awe? Are you ob uh, uh, oblivious of who he is? Do we, are you right now, where you're sitting, in your pew, are you worshiping him? And are you at this very moment saying, he is my king? Or, or are you oblivious to the fact? He's wonderful. He's wonderful. I mean, we're talking about a wonderful God. D do you get excited when you think about Jesus? If you don't, you've lost your wonder. That means you have calluses on your soul. And folks, I want to tell you, we need to take Christians and rise them up and raise the banner of Christianity. And there's no better time than right now at Christmas because Jesus' name is a saving name and it wants to save you. It's knocking on your door. Folks, did we come to worship him? Jesus is wonderful. You say, what? He is wonderful. He is wonderful in his birth. He is wonderful in his life. He is wonderful in his teaching. He is wonderful in his miracles. He is wonderful in his death. And he is wonderful in his second coming. Woo, man, if that don't make you excited, I don't know what will. You see, my friends, his name is wonderful. Has any of you ever just stood still and just worshiped the wonderful God? Or are you scared somebody's going to make fun of you? Don't worry about what the world thinks. If you want the true Christ of Christmas, you need to worship the wonderful God. Of the universe matter of fact I, I thought of a very simple story about a man that was riding on a train one time and he was looking out the window and everything they passed all he could say was wonderful 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 and there was a man sitting right beside him he says why do you think everything is wonderful he said I've been blind and I had surgery and I'm seeing the things that I hadn't seen in so long and forgotten how beautiful they are. And so they are all wonderful to me. Folks, my Jesus is wonderful to me. And the problem is we don't get excited about Jesus any longer because the world has told us not to. And we need to get, be, uh, get more excited about Jesus than we ever have before. We should be having revival in our services, not sitting like we're statues or a wooden Indian. We need to be worshiping him because he's wonderful. Well, the name didn't just stop there. Not only is Jesus' saving name wonderful, but my friends, listen, there, there, there is wisdom in his name. My friends, his name is called Counselor. And, and when I thought about Counselor, do any of you need a counselor sometime? You know, sometimes people come to me for counsel. And I can't solve their problems, but I point them to the one that can solve their problems, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's wisdom in that name. Matter of fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption in 1 Corinthians. So my friends, not only is he wonderful, not only is he a counselor, and he's an almighty God. There's wealth in his name. The name of Jesus that we're worshiped this Christmas. That means it all belongs to him. He made it all. And what's the world coming to? People tell me all the time, where's the world coming to? The world's coming to Jesus. 
It came from him and it's going back to him because he made it all. Billions of suns uh, came, suns like suns in the, in the uh, space, came from his hand. When he spoke, oceans dripped from his fingers. The earth is just a speck. And he made it. The earth is the Lord's. So my friends, when you say this is my house, that's not your house. That's God's house. That's that little bitty baby in that manger in Bethlehem's house. Well, this is all of my stuff. That stuff is God's. And if there's a mother here today, you listen very closely to me because I want to tell you something. We need to teach our children that Jesus is the counselor. We need to teach them that he's the counselor. Because listen, that child that you hold, that child that you feed, those diapers you change, and when my mind turned to, I knew I'd never do that ever again. I want to tell you what this is. It's a gift from God. Folks, those are not our children. They're God's children. He let us be the caretaker. That's all. To be the caretaker. To love them and comfort them. So my friends, the earth is the Lord's. And my friends, I also want to realize, and I hope that you'll understand this too. He's a mighty God. He's a mighty God. And you say, a mighty God? Yes, he's a mighty God. Now, what in the world do you mean by that? I read an article. I know some of you think I can't believe, cause, I mean, I can't read because I'm from Alabama. But I did read. One time I read many years ago. I know this is hard to believe. Listen to me. One drop of water, one drop of water that you drink. Let's think about this. One drop of water. I read an article about it. And I was blown away by it. Just I just can't believe that I even thought of it the other day when I was thinking about today. But one drop of water has molecules in it. Matter of fact, if you took as many molecules that are in one drop of water, and each one of those molecules became sand, that one drop of water has enough molecules to make enough grain of sands to make a half a mile wide and two foot deep bridge from New York to San Francisco. If you don't think there's a mighty God after that, there's something wrong with your thinker. There's something thing wrong with us if you don't think he's, I mean, half a mile wide, two feet thick, from New York to San Francisco, a molecule just in one drop of water. What a mighty God we serve. Do you think he's mighty? Do you think our mighty God can touch what you're going through in your life right today? Do you believe that God can take your frustration and make it right? Do you believe that our God still does miracles? Do you believe our God is still uh, a mighty God, that he can change things like never before? You see, the problem is Christians have not become expectant of what God can do. When we come to worship him, are we going to check that box off? Let's stop checking off the box and let us stand up and say, Mighty God, thank you for what you've done for us. He's mighty above any other God. But my friends, his name is everlasting. That means there's worship in his name. Do you know that Jesus is to be worshipped? Who do we worship today? We should be worshipping God because he has given us everlasting life. Matter of fact, John said in Revelations 22, verse 8 and 9, this is what John said. John was, uh, this was towards the end of the book of Revelation at the end and John does this, listen to this. And I, John, saw these things, heard them, and when I heard and seen, I fell down and worshipped before the feet of an angel, which shewed me these things. He saith unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, for thy brethren the prophets, of them which keeps the saying of this book, Worship God. Folks, our everlasting God at Christmas deserves our worship. And my friends, John had got it mixed up. He bailed down and worshipped an angel. Angel says, get up from there. Well, get up. He says, get up before something happens to you because I, you're going to get in trouble and I'm going to get in trouble. I'm not God. And my friends, how, how many today would the angel say, get up, you're worshipping the wrong thing? How many of you at Christmas season would be ready and willing to admit we worship wrong things? You say, oh, no, I don't. We all do. But there ain't but one mighty God. 
There ain't but one wonderful counselor. But he's the everlasting God. My friends, what will you worship this Christmas? And what are you worshiping this very moment? Gifts, trees, people. Folks, there is no God here but Jesus. I don't care how much money somebody has. I don't care how well they dress and how well they speak. There is but one God. And he is an everlasting Father. But then uh, there's one last thing of this, the name, the saving name of Jesus is there's welfare in his name. He is called the Prince of Peace. Do you have peace today? You see, if you don't have peace, you may not be worshiping the Jesus of Christmas. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God through Jesus came to give you peace. Has anybody ever left you anything in a will? Like land, money? Jesus did. Do you know he left a will for you? Do you know what his will is for you? Do you know what your inheritance that he left for you here on earth? What he has left for you? The words he said from the cross. Do you know the words that he said from the cross when he finished? On the cross he said, My peace leave I with you. My peace I give unto you. Our peace. Jesus gave his peace to you. And there's no lawyer on this earth that can break the will of Jesus. It's yours. It's a throne gift from Jesus. It's yours. You see, what good is Christmas if you're not at peace with God? That's the peace he gives you. And folks, if you're having a hard time in your life, you're not at peace with God. Let those things go and say, I've got the peace of God and my God can overcome anything in this world today. That's who we worship this Christmas season is the Prince of Peace. He came. What good is it to have that peace and not open the gift? I thought of a story that a woman was dying. And they told her, do you know that you're dying? And she said, yes. Do you have peace with God? She said, no. They thought, well, maybe she didn't understand what they were saying. So they, they asked her again, do you know you're dying? She said, yes. Have you peace with God? She says, no. She said, I am resting in the peace that Jesus made on the cross. Amen. My friends, he made peace between, he brought peace between God and man. Are you at peace this Christmas season? If not, you need to open the gift that Jesus gave you. And that's peace. Now, he came to bring you peace. But what, now listen to me, some of you have already gone to the mall and fought people on Black Sunday, Black Friday, whatever it's called. People used to, get, used to die at Walmart on Black Friday. That's senseless. Do you know that's the most useless thing I've ever heard in my life? Do you not realize that there is nothing on sale? People say, oh, it's on sale. You better check yourself because I watched a commercial the other day where all that... Uh, um, Target did was to, it said on sale price that was in red and then it said and then they put a Black Friday over it with the same price on it. it said sale. You know why people bought it? Because it said it's on sale. It was still six hundred forty nine dollars and ninety five cents. You see, here's what I want you to understand. Some of you have made lists for your children, for your parents, for your family, their husband. Their husband, you know, people buy their husband gifts, Stacy. I hadn't had a gift in 21 years. Ever since Lydia's been in uh, in this world just about, I ain't had a gift. She said, I don't believe in getting gifts. Well, then why do we buy thousands of dollars for Lydia? My friends, I don't need a gift. I've got the greatest gift that's ever been given, and that's the Prince of Peace. But how many of you have made your Christmas list and you forgot Jesus? Will you buy Jesus a gift this Christmas? Will you? Or is it just talk that we worship Jesus, our Lord and Savior? 
How many of you will read the Christmas story on Christmas morning before you tear up those, that paper? How many of you will make a birthday cake and celebrate Jesus because it's his birthday and not ours? How many of us will be ready and willing to say, I bought him a gift? Folks, the greatest gift that you can give Jesus this very Christmas is you. He wants you and you alone. My friends, the greatest event and human history is the birth of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you for the time to be here. And Lord, as we stand and sing in just a moment in 302, I hear thy welcome voice. May we hear your voice from the cross saying, I have given you my peace. And Lord, if people will be honest with themselves right at this very moment, they are sitting in this pew today and they're not at peace. And if you're not at peace... It's a shame. I'm at peace because Jesus lives inside of my life. Are you at peace with God? Are you at peace with family? Are you at peace with your circumstance? Are you at peace with your finances? Are you at peace? Jesus says, I give my peace to you. If you're not using your inheritance in the world that you live in, what a sin that is. He gave it to you. And he wants you to be at peace. Answer that question before you leave here today. You see, that's the greatest event of Christmas. Lord, I ask your blessings now as we sing. As the invitation, only you can change lives. Only you can make people move. Only you. It's up to you now. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being that wonderful counselor. That mighty God, the everlasting Father that will never die, and that Prince of Peace. But Lord, are we truly at peace this Christmas? Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time. And we pray this now in your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Join us.